Hey everybody, I want to talk to everyone today about knee pain from squatting. This is something that Glenn is actually having some problems with right now. So I did what any good training partner would do and started looking up what does science have to say. So this is not going to cover squat form or technique because I am by no means an expert. Instead, I just went through a bunch of scientific studies different things, looking at what would be causing knee pain in the squats, what you have to look out for, uh, what the issues are. So I'm hoping that this can help you out. The very first thing that I want to say is the myth that squats are bad for your knees. That is 100% a myth. In fact, going through these studies, I have seen numerous occasions where squats were used and recommended in rehab programs. So it is a very good rehabilitation tool for knee injuries, in particular ACL tears. So the idea that a squat is going to be bad for your knees, it actually comes from, at least from reading these studies and a couple of different theories, the fact that most people that go into a doctor's office for knee pain because of squats have done something wrong. However, when the doctors start recording the injuries, they see, hey, all these people coming in for with knee problems, that's because they're squatting. So squats are bad for your knees. That's kind of where that came from because you don't go to the doctor if your knees are feeling awesome. You don't go up and say, hey doc, guess what? I'm squatting, my knees feel awesome. Okay, so that is a myth that squats are bad for your knees. All right, second thing that I wanted to mention is that although squats are perfectly safe for your knees if performed correctly, not everyone has the same knee. Not everyone is built the same. Everyone has different leverages. Everyone has different bone structures. And of course, everyone has different injuries. If you have certain injuries, that does not mean that you can squat the same as everyone else. So it's going to have to be tailored very much to you as an individual in what you can and cannot handle. So let's go over a couple different squats here. This is an illustration showing the three different types of squat bar position. You have from left to right the front squat, the high bar squat, and the low bar squat. Now what I want you to pay attention to is not the center of gravity, but how much forward knee travel you have in these different situations. You can see that as the higher the bar, the further your knees are going to travel forward. Here's another illustration. You can see that low bar position on the right, the hips are much further back, the shins are more vertical and the knees are closer to the toes. And what I mean by all knees not being equal, look at this Olympic lifter here. Look at how deep he is and how much strain there is on the knee. You need healthy knees to do that. There are hybridizations of every one of those. It's all about where you put the bar. That's the only difference. Where are you putting the bar on this? So I want you to look at these pictures and notice the different knee positions and the back angles, where the center of gravity is over your foot. So again, you can see the bar position is going to affect your back angle, your knee travel, and your hips. These are all things to consider. Now, one of the things that I'm going to do that I don't normally do is I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the results of all the studies right now so you don't have to watch the whole video. And then I'm going to discuss all of the different studies in a little bit more detail towards the end of the video. So if you want to know the specifics, go ahead and keep watching. So, the first thing. Every single study that I looked at determined that the majority of knee torque and forces at the knee were posterior. Meaning that the front of your knee, the ACL, bore almost no force, no pressure. And every single study recommended that squats were safe for ACL injuries and rehabilitation. So most of the force, again, in the posterior, and those are shearing forces. Most studies found that the pressure increased 
the further down you went. The deeper your squat, the higher the shearing forces and the higher the compressive forces. Now, for those of you who don't know, shearing force is what we really need to be worried about. That is when your bones are going to move in opposed directions. So, for example, if this is your tibia, so the bottom part of your leg, and this is your femur, you have one bone going in this direction and another bone going in this direction. Okay, th this is what you do not want. This is going to cause tears. This is going to have all sorts of negative impact. And, of course, if you do somehow manage to twist your knee joint, you could quite possibly injure the ACL. So it's very important to make sure that you are not allowing your knees to twist at any point in the squat. However, all these studies did use people that were experienced somewhat in the squat. Most of these had at least some sort of gym experience. And uh, in a couple of studies, the people that they studied could squat at least 1.5 times their body weight. Some of them were not that high. And the study uses different weights. Some of them were pretty light and some of them were pretty heavy. But they all determine the same thing. The deeper you go, the more force you're going to have. Now a compressive force is something that your body is actually equipped to handle, although if you do have cartilage issues, it can become a problem. And that is compressive, they're going to be aligned, so you're going to be smashing down. So your femur is going to be smashing straight down into your tibia, and that could damage your cartilage or damage the joint. But that is what your knees are made to do. As you know, we stand straight up. So your body is well equipped to deal with compressive forces. It's the same thing with your back when you are deadlifting. As long as you're sticking to compressive forces, it's not a big deal. However, as soon as you get shearing forces, it's really bad. Now, what I want to point out is even in a deep squat, the shearing forces, which were predominantly in the posterior, were well within the tolerance of what the joint and the tendons could handle for a healthy knee. That's key, a healthy knee. So what they found is, the further your knees went past your feet, the further your forward knee travel was, the more the pressure and force increased. And there was an interesting study where they actually stopped someone from being able to tra have their knees travel forward, and they discovered that that eliminated most of the force in the knee and instead transferred it to the hips and lower back. So that's a whole different issue and a problem there. But if you're having knee pain, one, there's two things right there. You're going too deep. Your knees are traveling too far forward past your toes. Okay. Now, another one is bouncing at the bottom of the squat. And uh, right here, let me just refer to my notes here because I want to give you the exact number. So, referring to notes. Bouncing at the bottom of the squat increased shear force by approximately 33%. Okay? So, now, if you had a healthy knee, you weren't worried about any of this anyways because you're well within your allowable tolerance, but now you're starting to get knee pain and you're bouncing at the bottom, well, it's probably because of that. And one of the things that they did identify in a couple of different studies is when you go too low, the, a lot of the shear force is now going to increase because your hamstrings are actually making contact with your calf. Like in this situation. And now it is actually forcing your knee joint apart. So, to again illustrate with my awesome hands, you're coming down, all of a sudden this touches here. Well, what's going to happen? It can't keep going, so this has to pull apart. So you start getting, again, the shearing forces where they're going in opposing directions. And that's going to snap your knee. It's not going to feel good. So if you're getting pain in the squat, those are three things right there that you need to look at. Okay. So if you're squatting too deep... Uh, solution that they found, switch to a low bar stance. You will not squat as deep with a low bar stance as long as you do it with proper form. You can also stop using Olympic lifting shoes if you are. Anything with a raised heel is going to allow you to not have 
your ankle flexibility limit your depth, your forward knee travel. So the more your ankles can bend, the further your knees can go forward and the deeper you can go. So if you're having way too much trouble with going too deep, too much knee pain, you can get rid of the heels, go to flat shoes if you have the ankle flexibility for it. The other thing that you can do to start training it is really practice keeping your knees as far back as possible. Now, one of the studies found that a shank, which I'm thinking, you know, shank, ah! No, apparently shank means your shins from your knee to your ankle, which I did not know. That was news to me. You want it as vertical as possible to eliminate any sort of shearing or high force on your knee. And that's actually recommended. Again, let me refer to my notes. The Barbell Squat Exercise Guidelines, as published by the National Strength and Conditioning Association, so the big wigs, cite the need to keep the knees from moving forward past the toes or to keep the shank, the shank as vertical as possible when performing the exercise. Okay, But what they found, and this is interesting, that... They recommend, in order to optimize the forces at all involved joints, meaning your back, your hips, your knees, it may be advantageous to permit the knees to move slightly, slightly past the toes when in a parallel squat position. Now, this study found that the person who could squat the most weight in their study had the least shearing amount of force in the knee. The person who had the highest in the study was not a good squatter and had the most forward knee travel. Okay? So, those of you who are concerned about your knees, those are a couple of things that you can look at. Now, another thing that I'm going to mention, as I said, the deeper you go, the more likely you are to increase the shear force and have problems with your knee. Because if you are not able to push your hips far enough back to hit depth and you attempt to force depth, you are going to have your knees go forward. And I see it in videos all the time. Now again, by no means am I saying I am an expert squatter. I can watch my squat form and tear it apart myself and I'm working on it and that's always a work in progress. But one thing for me, I had to go to rehab for my knee. I spent three months in rehab for my knee when I just started lifting. Why? I was squatting wrong. I had no idea what I was doing. I had a high bar, knees traveling forward. I went. I broke at the knees first. I did not break at the hips and messed up my knee. Three months in rehab. So I've been there. I had to learn how to do it. And again, not an expert, but having to learn that. One of the things that they found is if you have problems in your knees, in particular your PCL, so again, ACL relatively safe in all of these studies, the 0 to 50% degree range of motion is what they found would minimize your knee force. Now, that's not going to be anywhere near depth, okay? So, but that's just something to think about. If your knees are hurting you now, again, squat higher, don't squat too high, you know, powerlifting, hips break the knees, unless again, you're bodybuilding or whatever, or rehabbing, go ahead. Knees don't travel too far past the toes. You're going to minimize it. So, you know, we're talking about the, if this is your toes, your knees are going to be around right here, not way out here. And I mean, I, identical or <laughs> theoretically perfect. Your knee would be directly over your ankle, okay? So a vertical shank. But they found if you go just a little bit forward that you're going to share the low between the knee and the hip, okay? So now I'm gonna go a little bit more specific into the studies themselves, all right? So if you like, I don't wanna care about the science, you already told me what I need to know, go ahead and stop the video. But first study. Effective knee position on hip and knee torques during the barbell squat. 
Now this is a really cool study. What they did, this is uh, where they took seven weight trained men who could all squat at least 1.5 times their weight, and they had them perform repetitions, uh, three repetitions, uh, and they put a bunch of cameras up. They would allow them to do an unrestricted squat. So you squat however you squat. And then they put a board straight up from their toes so their knees could not go past their toes. So their knees would actually hit the board and then they have to go backwards. What they found is in the unrestricted squat, the forces at the knee were actually greater than those at the hip. Okay? Uh, and this was however they wanted to squat. So from the pictures, it looks like it was a high bar squat. But it's not something that I was there, so I can't tell you for sure that they were all high bar. But the force at the knee was higher than the hip. Okay, And the unrestricted, the forces at the knee were 150 nms, and the hip was only 28.2. And then there was a, a, very, a standard deviation of the knee of 50 and at the hip of 65. So even if you applied that entire standard deviation there, you're not going to get close. When they restricted it, so the board in the way, they found that the knee went down to 117. So right there, we cut off a good 33. And the hip went up to 302. Okay, so the force at the hip went up incredibly high. And that is going to be your powerlifting low bar squat style. You break at the hips first. You're going to have a really far uh, back hip position. Your knees are going to be almost vertical above your ankle. And your lower back is going to come down. Now what they found in every single instance in this study is when you restricted the knees, your back had to lean forward to compensate. Now, a couple of cool things about this, so we already lowered the pressure on the knee, but we also decreased the range of motion required of the ankle. We actually got to have six degrees less range of motion required of the ankle, which is very nice. The knees ended up having around seven degrees less motion required, so... That's pretty neat. I mean, again, we shortened it down. And per their study, they said they were forcing depth. So all these people supposedly went to depth. But the hip angle decreased because, again, you have that forward lean. Now your angle's decreased. Re unrestricted was here. Restricted was here. So they discussed that you have to weigh the trade-off. Do you want to place more force and torque on the hips and back, or do you want more at the knee? So again, the further forward your knee is going to travel, the more of the weight it's going to take. So I'm just going to read you a couple of the things that they found here. Because it has been noted that lumbar shear forces increase with greater forward lean, and they found that in a, a different study, and that less skillful lifters exhibited greater forward lean. So if the less experienced you are, the more chance you are to lean forward too far. And you will see that on countless YouTube videos. It is important to note that the restricted squats require a smaller torso angle relative to horizontal. It thus becomes a trade-off between optimal knee positioning and optimal hip and back positioning. The net result is that proper lifting technique must create the most optimal knee uh, kinetic environment for all the joints involved. So your, your knee, lower back, and your hips. So what I said just scientifically, right? So when knee forces during a squat are normalized for the mass of the system, the body and the barbell together, compressive forces have ranged from 50 to 275% of the load lifted, while shear forces have ranged from 30% to 80% of the load lifted. It should be noted that compressive knee forces of up to 8,000 N have been reported for the squat, 
but these values were associated with a point higher in the range of motion, 74% knee flexion, so they were not hitting depth at that point, than was used in the present study. So if you are using too much of the force at the knee, you're going to hit that higher range in the force. So again, 275% of the weight lifted and compressive and 80% in shearing force, that is not something you want to have done to your knees. So in general, these forces become greater with increasing depth of the squat motion, although it is not known if this pattern continues with performing the squat through a ROM used in the present study. So they didn't go super deep, they stopped at where they were at. There were a couple of different other studies that looked at that. And again, in this study, they stated that this could be used for ACL. And uh, last point on this study uh, is in regards to technique. An often overlooked variable is patellar compressive force. So that's the front of your knee, basically your kneecap, which increases with decreasing knee angle. This compressive force is influenced by the placement of the barbell in either the high bar position, such as typically used by lifters, meaning Olympic lifters, or the low bar position, such as typically used by power lifters. While evidence indicates that the low bar position would decrease anterior cruciate ligament strain, patellar compressive force, and shear forces, so it'll decrease all three, these forces are consistently well within the capacities of these structures with either bar position. While increasing the forward tilt of the torso may decrease the forces at the knee, it is likely to also increase the forces in the lumbar muscles and ligaments. So they went on to say that if, if your knees are healthy, there's absolutely no reason to place more weight on your hips and back than on your knee because your knee can handle it. Okay, so really interesting study right there. That's how you can reduce your knees, uh, knee force. So the next one, a biomechanical comparison of back and front squats in healthy trained individuals. Now this is one thing that I really found interesting. Shear forces were equal between front and back squats. So those bar positions are incredibly different. And your center of gravity is different, your knee travel is going to be different, everything's different, but they found them to be equal. Shear forces are mostly posterior in nature, so they reference the same thing as the previous study. This is where they found that bouncing at the bottom of the squat increased shear force by approximately 33%. And this was actually in uh, another study that they referenced, which I read, but I'm not going to go into depth them. Biomechanical analysis of the knee joint during deep knee bends with heavy loads, which is a really good one. I recommend that if you uh, if you want to look at the different pressures at the the further you go with the heavier weight. Peer, peak shear forces occur when the knee is flexed 85 to 105 degrees. Okay, so parallel would be 90. So the peak is going to be right around parallel. And it's a little bit above, 85, so that's 5 degrees above, and then past that. So we're going from 90 to 105. And really, to perform a powerlifting squat, your hips have to break the knees, which is actually going to be a little bit higher of a degree there. In this position, the hamstrings are capable of creating a posterior shear force on the tibia. So as I mentioned, your hamstring makes contact with the calf. It's also pulling. It creates shear force there. The two squat variations, front back squat, were similar in some ways and quite different in others. For example, net shear forces, both anterior and posterior, at the knee did not vary with bar position, whereas net compressive forces and extensor movements increased for the back squat. And some of that is attributed to the fact that they were using more weight with the back squat. They were using 61.8 kilograms in the back squat versus 48.5 in the front squat. So 
The present study represents an effort to differentiate between the potential advantages and disadvantages of the two most commonly used forms of the squat exercise. Although bar position did not influence muscle activity, muscle activity was significantly different between the ascending and descending phases, which, leave it to scientists to be all psyched out that, dude, it's harder when you're actually having to push up the weight than it is going down. You could have talked to anybody that squatted, ever. Which is harder, going down or coming back up? The coming back up is the hard part, right? But they were all geeked out. Like, they mentioned it five or six times in the study. Like, oh, man, it's harder to ascend. It's harder to do <laughs> the concentric phase of the lift. Yeah, I know. Whatever. The front squat was shown to be just as effective as the back squat in terms of overall muscle recruitment with significantly less compressive forces on the knee. But again, some of that was attributed to the fact that the weight was higher. And another theory that they had was because the increased knee extensor movement was required during the back squat, it is attributed to the additional load lifted during that. So when you are extending the knee, so when you're coming back up in the back squat, because you are leaning forward a little bit more, you're pushing a little bit harder and you're having higher load, so that's going to increase the compressive forces. And again, unless you have some sort of cartilage damage or something inside the knee that's tore right now that you're trying to repair, we're not too worried about compressive forces. Unless you're getting in that upper level of power lifting where you're squatting, you know, 700 plus pounds, now you might be worried a little bit more of compressive knee forces. That's not something that you're going to worry about when you're getting started and sub 500 like me. Wimp squats, you know. Then I'm going to go over uh, the effects of technique variations on knee biomechanics during the squat and leg press. And this is just something that I wanted to go over uh, because they found that there were no real differences in foot position. So I'm not going to go into the leg press stuff, but what was interesting to me is they were comparing a wide stance to a close stance and they were comparing foot placement straight foot angle to 30 degrees. So you'll hear a lot of people recommend that we do all these weird foot angles to activate different muscles and, and do all these different things and that can lead to knee injuries. Because again, if you're getting that kneecap to twist because now your foot's pointing this way, your knee's going this way, that's going to create some sort of twisting motion. Now you can actually damage the ACL or other ligaments inside your knee joint. So let's look at what they found. No differences in muscle activity or knee forces between foot angle variations. Straight versus 30 degrees. Which is funny because I've had people argue with me that you need to have your feet pointed straight out for maximum muscle activation. No you don't. It says it right here. No ACL forces were produced for any exercise variation. Again, just another study that found that. They did find that for all stances, for all stances, the wide squat generated a higher PLC tensile force than the narrow squat. So the PCL, again, posterior part inside your knee, not your ACL, it's going to be strained more with a wider stance. The wider stance also generates a higher tibiofemoral compressive force and patellofemoral compressive force. So both sides of your knee joint, the compressive force increases. So your knee is out wider and for whatever reason that translates to the compressive forces increasing. Again, we're not too worried about the compressive forces. And this is where they found, because all knee forces increase with knee flexion. So the deeper you go, force increases. 
training with the functional 0 to 50 degrees range may be efficacious for those I don't know what that even means I have no idea for those whose goals is to minimize knee forces so again if you're dealing with a really bad knee injury and you can't do anything else to fix it you might want to squat shallow and just do it and be ridiculed and don't post the videos there you go for all exercises Mo oh, I, this is funny. This is really funny. So again, what I mentioned there, y'all geeked out like it's harder when you're going up. For all exercises, so they were comparing all the different stances, all the different feet, and the, the leg press and the squat, muscle activity and knee forces were generally greater in the knee extending phase than the knee flexing phase. So it's harder when you had to actually push and come back up than it was to go down. Again, just... Logic, guys. You don't even need to study that. So a couple of different other studies that I went into this, and they all backed this stuff up. Uh, now, I, I do want to point out, there was a little bit of dispute on whether or not the front squat and the back squat truly activated all the same musculature, but they are going to do more studies on that. So when we hear about that, we'll check that out. But that has nothing really to do with what we're talking about with knee pain. A biomechanical analysis of the knee joint during deep knee bends with heavy loads. Knee shear forces during a squat exercise using a barbell and a weight machine. Now, what I will say about that is they did find that a weight machine was increasing the shearing forces by 30 to 40 percent. So, train with a barbell. Uh, I wouldn't use a Smith machine and I would not use a weight machine if you're having any issues with your knees at all. Knee biomechanics of the dynamic squat exercise. A three-dimensional biomechanical analysis of the squat during varying stance width. Stance width and bar load effects on leg muscle activity during the parallel squat. So those are all the different studies that I looked at and went through to go and find out why are the knees hurting. So my conclusion something's damaged in the knee or you're doing bad form in either cases you should immediately stop squatting and start looking at your form get a camera out don't even use a barbell see what you're doing are you going way too deep are your hamstrings hitting your calves are you bouncing in the hole are your knees traveling ridiculously far forward? And one of the things that you can do to practice that, to prevent that, is actually practicing wall squats. So if you are having a lot of forward knee travel, face a wall. Step away from the wall three to six inches, depending on how bad you are to start with, because you're going to train yourself. And now, squat. You're going to break at the hips. Nothing should touch the wall. Your face shouldn't touch the wall. Your knees shouldn't touch the wall. Your belly shouldn't touch the wall. I had that problem. But nothing should touch the wall. Train that. Practice, even if you're raw, even if you're bodybuilding, practice some box squats. Set the box far enough behind you that you have to sit back. You have to get your shins or your shank as vertical as possible. These are all things that are going to help you get around squat pain at the knees. Because again, you should not have pain when you're squatting. Knees are improved from squats. Like that's the purpose. You squat and you get strong knees. Now, if you get into the higher levels, as I said, compressive force becomes an issue and injuries become an issue. If you're, the weight is too high, you can tear things. It is a given. So, stop having the ego. Just stop. Deload. Go back. You need to train with the bar. You need to train with 135. 
You need to relearn how to squat. Don't just keep doing it. Don't make excuses that my knee hurt. Fix it. Figure out why you're having the problem. Are you the one whose knees are too forward? Start doing wall squats. Start doing box squats. Get your hips to come back. Are you the one that's bouncing in the hole? Slow it down. Do pause squats. Do breathing squats, which are neat. And in both of those situations, you are going to take the weight down. You can even do uh, pin squats. So you go down and, and you set the pins. So you hit depth and it actually takes the bar off. So you got to stay there. Hold, breathe, come back up. Train yourself to do the descent slowly and you can power through the ascending portion of the lift. If you're the person that is just going way too deep, box squats, pin squats, again, just get it to stop you from going too deep. Uh, one of the things that I did uh, when we were having this problem is I actually had a lifting partner, Glenn, would put his hand like this where I was hitting depth. So I would just feel it and I'd come back up. You may not want to touch your partner's lift uh, butt. If you don't want to touch your lifting partner's butt, then I don't know why you're power lifting or doing strongman in the first place because you should totally be comfortable with that. I mean, I learned that from Mark Bell. You should be okay with touching your lifting partner's butt. It shouldn't make you uncomfortable. We're trying to prevent knee pain here, guys. So that's it. If you have any questions, you want me to go over anything else, you want me to go further in depth into these studies, please let me know. Take it easy, guys. Squat to depth, but do it without pain. Do not hurt your knees. You need these to walk around. You need these to have fun. And you do not want to be the person sitting there in your cast getting reconstructive surgery or even worse, being the person that refuses to squat because your knees hurt. In fact, the EMG level 